It's almost like you guys are trained. Kind of got quiet. How is everyone? Good. It's Sunday morning. We're in church. And uh, the world is not burning up and blowing away. And we must be thankful for. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you. Uh, Thank you that you are the author of salvation, Lord, that you are the lover of our souls, that you are the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Righteousness, Lord, that you reign um, and you've adopted us. We, we get that inheritance, that righteousness, Lord, that is, that is solely ascribed to you. Lord, what a treat to be your children and to be able to be here this morning, worshiping you together, loving you and loving on each other, Lord. It's, it's a good thing today to be in your house. And we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, and pray you would help us by your spirit to, to make the most of it, Lord, to honor you and glorify you. In Jesus' name. Lord, we have come to this house where we love to sing your praises. We lift our hearts and our hands to the King just hear us lord we pray come jesus come come fill this place meet us here meet us here lord. we are few but we are strong when you surround us meet us here Come, come fill this place. Meet us here. Meet us here, Lord. We are few, but we are strong when you surround us. Meet us here. Let us go into the house of the Lord. I 
was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord, our King shall stand in the gates of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of our King, Jerusalem, prayer of peace we bring. When they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Jesus, 
to sing your name. Love to sing your name. Love to sing your name. Worship you with all my heart. We do worship you this morning, Lord. In your name above all other names, worthy to be praised, worthy of all of our praise. Lord, you hold the universe in your hands. And it's your delight to say that we are the apple of your eye, Lord. Amazing. Amazing to consider that. Lord, especially for so many of us as we get older and we, we find things failing with us physically and even mentally, Lord, to know that you delight in us. We're just but dust. Thank you for your love, Lord. You stood before creation with eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before my failure, Lord, you carried the cross for my shame, with my sin weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. What can I say? What can I do? Offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So I'll walk upon salvation with your spirit alive in me. My life to declare your promise, my soul now to see. What can I say? What can I do? Offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. What can I say?
So what can I say? Hey, what can I do? Offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. And what can we say? Lord, what can we do? Offer our hearts, oh God, completely. So wonderful is your unfailing love. The cross has spoken mercy over me. I have seen no errors, no heart can fully know. The glorious and beautiful you are. Beautiful one night. Should my heart with this love Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you Yes, you opened my eyes to your wonders You captured my heart with this love Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you Beautiful one I love Beautiful one can we do but praise you, Lord? <laughs> when you bring uh, beauty out of the ashes, you, you take something that's wretched and you make it pure, Lord. You resurrect the dead. Our souls must sing, Lord. We must praise you. Whom have I in heaven but you, O Lord? We thank you this morning that we can know you. Lord, it's one thing that you're out there. It's a whole other thing that you've revealed yourself to us, Lord. Thank you for that this morning. 
We love you and we praise you, Lord. We just pray your blessing on uh, our time as we open your word and we have time to fellowship and pray and and just delve into what you have for us today. Lord, we pray that you would be pleased with it, but that you would also lead it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, sure, cool. Well, I'll try to back up the mic. I'll have Ben hang out here for just a second. Um, I just wanted to pray for him, you know. I've tried to at least, because the scriptures really make this uh, analogy or this way to understand the coming of the Lord, and he uses labor pains. <laughs> and that... Uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes we have uh, false alarms, and sometimes, you know, we feel like thing that we're not maybe not prepared or don't know what to expect. Because, well, none of us have been around for Jesus coming before. So, <laughs> and 2020 has been one of those years where you're like, Lord, is it time? Oh, okay, maybe not. Lord, is it time? And uh, so I just, I don't know. I was thinking about. And we've been praying for Ben this weekend, and so I just want to have him share a little bit. Um, we can maybe even talk about Mike and Katie as well. Just kind of an exciting time for us here as, as uh, we're going to get some new additions shortly. So how can we pray for you? Uh, well, uh, long story short, everyone's having a baby. <laughs> <laughs> not literally. No, <laughs> Just <not>. about. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, my wife, Dory, um, and I are very close. The due date's next Saturday. Um, so I thought it was safe to plan some stuff this weekend, but that was... <laughs> and it turns out it kind of was, but it kind of wasn't. Um, yesterday morning, um, started to have um, contractions that were a little different than the Braxton Hicks that she'd have and had, and so we've started canceling plans then, but left the evening because we weren't sure, and by the middle of the day, it had faded out after about uh, eight hours or so of having, you know, kind of sporadic contractions. Um, so then we had the youth group come over, and we had a game night here at the church, um, and she didn't tell me, but we started that at 5.30, 6.30. She started having a lot of pain all, all the time and contractions. And she didn't tell me till 8 o'clock. <laughs> she was like, I didn't want to distract you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she's awesome. <laughs> um, but um, we were pretty sure it was go time. Like, we were pretty sure that it was going to be time to get to the hospital very quickly. Um, and... Uh, it it seemed like it was ramping up, and then right around 11 o'clock at night, it kind of started to calm down, and after somewhere after midnight, she had a last contraction for the evening, then we fell asleep and woke up this morning. I was like, oh, I guess I could have done worship. <laughs> Might as well show up. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, just prayer for us um, that the Lord would um, give us wisdom, because I've never seen anything like this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Um, so just for, for strength for Dory, um, for peace and wisdom for us, for, for me to know when she's in pain and having a hard time making her thoughts clear, for me to know when it's time to go to the hospital. <laughs> so, and just for, yeah, for, for peace and rest for us and to know what to do and what to hold off on. And and the same, Katie and Mike are like a week away from this, but they've already done it twice, so. Yeah, so have it. So you guys had, uh. Had to do some baby turning early on. Is yes. everything okay in that department? Yeah, oh. absolutely. Um, baby was breech. I'm happy to be so. Um, so she it was head up, and, and every time that she would flip around, we'd be like, okay, maybe she'll, she'll no, she'd flip back up. Um, so we actually went into the hospital um, and had the doctors turn her, which was a heck of a thing to watch. Um, but yeah, just turned her around and got her head down, and Dory had a belly brace for a while so that she was locked in and couldn't do her standard gymnastics. Um, but she's head down, staying head down. She's happy, healthy, kicking all the time. So yeah. Yeah, right. praise the Lord. He's been yeah, with us all, every step. Every step, like you said, is like, is this it? Is, this, is the earthquake coming? <laughs> so, but, so. Yeah, he's good, and we're, we're right. doing well. So we're excited. Yeah, a couple new additions, Lord willing, to the family and to our family here here shortly. So we're excited to see it come to pass. So be praying for them. And Father, we just want to 
Oh, Lord, it's exciting, Lord, as, as just a constant reminder, Lord, as you've given so many of us a reminder in our life, Lord, this, uh, this heritage, this gift, <laughs> Lord, sometimes this trial. Uh, so, Lord, we just want to lift up both these, these precious families. Lord, they are precious to us, and we know that they are way more precious to you. May we continue to pray for them, be excited with them. Lord, we are, we are instructed to rejoice with those who would rejoice, Lord. And, and this year we could use a little of that. So we're just excited. And, and Lord, just bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. So, all right. Okay, a couple other announcements. Uh, Carl, if you want to bring up that uh, video, Cor, if you want to make your way out real quick. Um, one to walk through. And, and I got reminded, maybe I'll do it next week, of uh, maybe explaining just a little bit more about who Behold Israel is and, and some of the people that are going to be involved in the prophecy conference coming up, but we're trying to, going to be for numbers sake and keep a track things, we want to run everything through the website if we can and, and have people signed up so that um, well, we'll have lanyards that we'll be giving everybody and, and uh, just to keep track of all that we need to keep track of. And so Corey was going to walk through how to do that in case you were not computer savvy. But while... Yeah, so we have the prophecy... Update coming up. Um, uh, you don't have to play that yet. I'm not quite there yet. Thank you. <laughs> um, and it's going to be October 16th through 17th, I believe. It's taking place on a Friday and a Saturday. I believe Friday it's 6 p.m. through 8.30. And then Saturday it's 8 a.m. to 5. I believe it's $10. So at 11 and a half hours. That's like 87 cents an hour, so I think that's really affordable. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm going to show you how to register on the website. Um, it's just at roseburgchristianfellowship.net. If you don't know, if you forget it, you can just Google it. Um, I don't know how to work this. <laughs> so you go to upcoming events. There you go. Oh, I got to hold it. Okay, and then right there, oh gosh, I'm shaking. Um, you can click here <laughs> to register. And then it's going to open up this. Here you can see the dates and the times and who's going to be speaking. It's going to tell you how much it costs and where it's at. Um, and then the, right over here, there's going to be a register button. You can also click login, but I just click register because it's big and easy. Um, here you're going to have two options. Uh, first, I'm going to show you how to log in. This one, you do have to put a phone number or an email address. If you put a phone number, please put one that receives text messages because you're going to receive an access code. Um, yeah, there's my phone number if you guys want it. Um, <laughs> and then you just hit next, and it's going to give you a code. If you can't receive text messages, just put in the email address. And then it's going to know who you are based on information that you've given us for the digital directory. And you're going to hit login. And then it's just going to double check that it's you. And you'll click over here. If you have multiple people, you'll click over here and you'll add them there. Um, this will be Oregon residents or out of state. They're both $10. Um, and then it's going to bring up all your information that we have in the directory. You're going to put in your card information. And this is what it's going to look like when you've paid. And then I believe next is the continue as a guest. You're just going to put your first name, last name, and an email address. And then you're going to click continue. And it's just going to go through the same exact process. And when you put in your card information, you're not going to see it here, but you will know <clears throat> that it's protected because there's going to be a little uh, lock box next to where you see the uh, website. And that's everything. All right, so if you guys have any questions, we'll be happy to do our best to answer them and to, to move forward with that. Because Behold Israel, is a, uh, they're a ministry that, that goes all over the world. I'll talk about them a little bit more next week. But uh, they have a ministry specifically to, well, it's really, it's really it's very um, based on Israel, obviously. Um, they are born-again Christians. They have a big ministry to those in Israel and informing a lot of us and, and keeping us up to date on news and 
and uh, prophecy as unfolds relating to the nation of Israel. So it would be great to have them, but with that also comes um, a lot of people out of the area, so that's one reason why we're going to go this route, uh, to help keep a little better track of that so that if necessary we can, if we have to make any changes, we can. Um, so that's that. Um, Gary, as promised, he put a couple sign-up sheets out in the foyer and downstairs for children's ministry. If, if God has been uh, so moving you in that direction and touching your heart uh, for that, they have needs pretty well across the board from nursery on up. So those are out there as well. Um, I think that's it. Yes? Ooh. Uh, this... <laughs> sorry, no, I was just remembering probably what you're going to say, so sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, and that's a real blessing. You know, they start off there in front of Mercy, which I assume you're going to again this year. And... Uh, the Adventist Church, it's not a march, it's a standing... Okay, not, not doing the walk. Okay, just the chain. All right, I'll catch up. So they're right there by Fred Meyer, there's the Adventist Church, and so they're going to meet there and, uh, and give our community, us, anybody who will hear a, a wonderful reminder of the value that God puts on life and the importance of, of always being reminded and continually reminding. And so, a wonderful ministry. Thanks. If you have any questions, I'm sure they'll be happy to answer them. <laughs> oh, Lord, we thank you for this morning. As we get into your word, as we consider the things that have happened, the things that are happening, Lord, may we learn from them. Lord, you are a God who speaks day and night for every moment of history, Lord, you've been speaking. God, may we hear from things that maybe are familiar, maybe from things that we've thought about before, or things maybe we haven't even thought about before. Um, Lord, we know that you are true. You are light, you are love, Lord, and you are coming. So may we prepare our hearts this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll pick back up in, Daniel, or in, in Revelation chapter 11 this morning, but I wanted to briefly kind of go back. We've talked so much about Daniel chapter 9, um, and rightly so as we go through the tribulation, and we're about to transli- transition into the second half of the tribulation, which is often referred to or should be rightly referred to as the Great Tribulation. The second half of the 70th week of Daniel, the last three and a half years. But in Daniel chapter 9, before he gets into this prophecy that's so relevant to the book of Revelation, Daniel was looking around at his people because they had been taken captive to Babylon. They hadn't been worshiping the Lord and and keeping the, the Sabbath, the Sabbath year as they should have. They were disobeying God, following idols, and and so God deported them to Babylon for a time. And Jeremiah, before they went in, specifically said, hey, it's going to be 70 years. And that had been Daniel's life. You know, from the time probably in his teenage years, and now he was probably somewhere in his mid-80s. And he'd seen what had happened throughout history. He'd seen the build-up to now it was time for a change, a time for them to leave. And in Daniel 9, I'll just read a couple verses and then 
just brief over it because I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but it says, In the first year, Daniel 9, 1, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And then he begins to just pray and he begins to look at his nation and he's looking at what's going on today and what is supposed to be happening just around the corner according to the Word of God. And I thought that was relevant as, as Daniel would talk about a temple that didn't exist when he was alive. In his, in his day, he would, he would speak about the temple of God, but it didn't exist when he was prophesying. As we're going to talk a little bit today about some of his prophecies, but also in Revelation, as John would prophesy in the late 90s A.D., about a temple that didn't exist. And to our day, still doesn't exist. But as we see, not Jeremiah per se this time, but Daniel and John are prophesying about something that must soon take the place. As we're looking at these things and we're saying, wow, this is, this is it. I think we should... Allow history to teach us. History teaches us that the present, our present time can reach us in a profound way. You know, not only history as it unfolds day to day, but history over the years, over the centuries. All of it is God's story, His story that speaks to us just as much, well, not just as much, but also speaks to us as his, as his Word does as well. These are things that we are all supposed to learn from, that, that as we put them and we put them up against the measuring stick, the instructions of God's Word that we are to learn. It's so interesting, you know, you always have that kind of cliche phrase that those who don't learn from history are bound to repeat it. And we look around and I find it interesting that and, and, I, and I guess I, I understand why there's so much division and so much struggle today. As you have a, a many of the older aging generations that experienced or saw or actually fought directly against in war, many of the ideologies and thought processes that are trying to be sold as good today. You know, as you, as you see the attempt to strip away the value of inalienable personal rights that no one, no mob, or no legislation should be able to take. And there's just a number of ways that, that as the individual right get taken away, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on what's in the news today on this particular subject, but you look at that and many people can say, this is exactly how you got to where we were in the early, mid, and later 1900s. As you look at communism or socialism trying to be sold again as a good thing. And I'm not necessarily for any particular style of government as the end all apart from Jesus ruling and reigning. But, if, you know, I, and again, this is something I mentioned over and over because to me it, it, doesn't, it just doesn't, it's amazing to me that it doesn't sink in. That you could take out your phone and and you can do a search. I'll use Google. I don't, I don't usually like to mention the name. They get too much attention as it is. But if you searched it, how many people died as a direct result of communism in the 1900s? I mean, it's not my words. It's not the words of some Christian professor. You'll, you'll come up with the average estimate somewhere between 80 and 100 million people. And that's not millenniums ago, that was with many people's lifetime ago. That many of your, my grandparents or, or maybe your parents or maybe even some here saw what happened under Mao, Stalin, Hitler, the atrocities that happened all across 
Asia. And yet, just in a few short decades, a lifetime, a generation or two, we begin to have these conversations all over again as if those things didn't happen or people have somehow gotten better. We've got to learn from history and let it teach us and affect our present. As parents, I think if we were going into this, if we knew that our kids would not learn from our mistakes, we might not have made so many of them. <laughs> we're just trying to help you guys. You know, we made all these mistakes so you can do better. <laughs> but they don't, and so often they go and may make their own mistakes, and, and so, goes, so goes the cycle. But <sighs> may we learn. May we learn. And as we look a little bit, we're going to look a little bit at um, some current events and and things this morning, and, and I, I hope that God uses it, because um, it's, a, it's a little bit different than my normal approach today. We'll, we'll have, talk a little bit more about events and not as much about directly in the scriptures. So, as we do, as we come to Revelation chapter 11, as we talked about last week, there was this announcement by this glorious messenger And he was announcing what was going to begin a glorious moment. Chuck Missler noted that this seven-year period, in particular, highlighted by this central point, middle of the tribulation, the middle of Daniel's 70th seven, is one of the most, or arguably the most documented time period in the scriptures. And so as God talks about it, he takes this time, this interlude, this intermission to to give us details of what's going on behind the scenes of the seals and the trumpets. God, it's a big deal to God. And it it therefore should be to us that these things have been building. You know, in these moments as we look for what's going on, everybody, you know, so many people in the world are looking for signs. What's going on? How do I understand what's, what's going on today? how life is going to get worse or better in the future. Some are looking at indicators and graphs and statistics and generating algorithms to try to understand how to understand our world today, data. Am I on the right track? Are things, is my world making sense? Is it falling apart? How do I interpret these things? So we got a few of those, a few more signs and data points this morning to see if we are tracking in the right direction. So Revelation chapter 11, I'm going to start with just the first couple of verses. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave the outer court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot 42 months. So, mentioned some verses to look at, and maybe did, maybe didn't. Um, but a straightforward reading of the scriptures, I believe, leads us to the conclusion that there will be a literal temple in Jerusalem. And arguably very, very soon. That Paul, I believe, is very clear in Thess- uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that there will be a man of sin. We understand him as the Antichrist, here the beast, that he will stand in the holy place, the holy of holies, in the temple of God, and he's going to say, I'm God. And then he's going to demand worship from the world, as if he was Yahweh. Jesus said this would come to pass in Matthew 24. And it seems that we are now here in this midpoint, which both Jesus and Paul said it would be in the center, and we'll have this timeline. And John's going to use, he's going to say it with months. He's going to say it with years. He's going to say it with days, that we might understand that it is exactly three and a half years. Now they ran off a 30-day month calendar, a 360-day year. We know that from, from Daniel's day and from this here as well, as well as other places. And so God says, hey, I want you to go measure it. 
the worshipers, the altar. And one thing about measuring, it does seem to show some nature or characteristic of ownership. Why God would want to own this temple, I don't know. It's kind of an affront to him. It's an insult to, to rebuild the temple and begin to sacrifice for the things which Jesus covered. There is a couple cases in Scripture where things are measured before judgment, so that could be. Regardless, in Scripture, this temple, even though it seems to be destroyed and a new one built for the millennium just a few years later, that it's referred to as the temple of God. Not just a box or just a building, but it seems to be attached to Him, whether that's because of the way the world understood it or because God is taking some ownership or investment in it at this point, I don't know. He measures the altar. He measures the worshipers. <laughs> and he said he's going to, that there's going to be this part and it's given over to the Gentiles and the Gentiles are going to tread on the holy city for 42 months for the next three and a half years. Which brings us back to this is the 70th week of Daniel. Which makes both Matthew 24, the seven year period we're talking about, this part of Revelation exceptionally Jewish because God said this is seven years for your people specifically for Israel and so we center around there and God always uses Israel as a centerpiece for prophecy now Israel may be the, the centerpiece but God's timeline always runs it seems on morality that his timeline runs on morals and when people and their relationship to him. So, it seems to be his temple. And this trampled underfoot is the idea of trampled with contempt. And we're going to see that in coming chapters. And, and begin to see that today. That, that the Gentiles are, are going to, under the Antichrist, they are going to trample not only Israel, but the Jewish people under feet with, with contempt. And that will exist from this moment until the, the coming of Jesus at the end. So how does this come to pass? We're talking about a, a temple on the Temple Mount, right? Anybody know some of the stuff that's there right now? The Dome of the Rock, you know, a couple mosques, some of the holiest sites for Islam. Now how did we get there? And then I'm going to talk about a little bit of a scenario of how perhaps this could come to pass uh, very quickly. Which doesn't mean it make it so, but it gives us the understanding of, of that everything's in place. This will be no problem for the Lord. So Israel becoming a nation, you know, I've often said that, you know, it'd be pretty easy if we backed up 300 years ago, 800 years ago, that maybe somebody could have argued with me that, well, maybe Revelation, maybe it's not so literal. Maybe it was a little more allegory. Maybe it's supposed to be teaching something else. You know, Israel wasn't a nation. You couldn't see two people anywhere in the world in one moment of time. There were just things that, that just seemed like it would just be impossible. But it really kicked into high gear about the middle of the 1900s in 1948 when Israel became a nation again. I mean, you see, you see so many things just take off like a rocket. I, I use knowledge oftentimes that since 1950, almost specifically, I mean, it's just taken off like a rocket. Everything really seemed to begin to change at that point. So it became a nation again. The impossible was done. Very few people, I mean, you were kind of, it was, you were kind of a fringe teacher for a long time if you thought Israel was going to become a nation again before 1900s. And then by 1967 in the Six-Day War, Israel regained biblical Jerusalem and people got really excited. But something happened in that because as the Arab nations came and, and God really just defended his city, that a man did something foolish and he, and he well... It, would seem foolish to me, but it seems a part now of the plan of God. He, he gave the Temple Mount in control of the Muslims. Where God's temple thought at the time should be was given to not God's people. But they were, they were desperate for peace. I mean, they, everything was in turmoil. So, hey, take the Temple Mount. 
And, and so people, well, there's supposed to be, God's temple's going to go there. What's going to happen? Somebody, you know, in desert storm, was somebody going to accidentally shoot a scud and blow up the dome of the rock? I mean, what, what's going to happen? How is this going to come to pass? Ultimately, we don't know. So I want to talk just a little bit about a possibility that seems to line up with Scripture for me. Again, your, your task is to be a Berean and study these things for yourself. So somewhere between now and the beginning of the tribulation, the church will be raptured. It will be taken up. It says violently grabbed out is the word harpazo, or we, we say rapture from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It will be caught up, snatched away. Somewhere around that time, in my opinion, the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war will occur. Somewhere around the time of the rapture and the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. I believe it occurs right before. Because in the midst of this, at the beginning of the tribulation, and I think a catalyst for all of this will be the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war, there will be a man, charismatic, a man of intrigue, a man who can solve problems, will begin to rise up. This man who's going to stand in the, the holy place, this beast, this antichrist, Daniel says that he's going to confirm a covenant for one week, one seven-year period, a seven-year peace treaty. Now, oftentimes, I always thought that that was going to be a peace treaty, that after this these ten nations come and God rises up and defends Israel, decimates them. Russia's just decimated from it. it. Seems that Turkey and many of the Muslim nations that come against are that a man's going to rise up and confirm a covenant. And that will begin the seven year tribulation. It's marked by this seven year covenant, Daniel says. He says, but this man who's going to strengthen, and it seems that, that maybe that's what it is, that he, he doesn't maybe make a new covenant, but that he gives strength or reinforces or, or makes a better deal out of one that already exists with the nation of Israel for peace and her neighbors. Interesting, you know, as right now, as many treaties are signed, and if you're watching kind of what's going on with Trump in the Middle East and the Abrahamic that's probably not said right. That's my, that's my English going wrong. Covenant between what they consider the descendants of Abraham, Ishmael and Isaac. And so as they're making treaties now with Saudi Arabia, and they're, they're starting to broker these peace deals that are virtually unheard of and made no progress on forever. Whether that leads to it or, or some of these covenants may be what the Antichrist will come in and, and give a little more strength to, we don't know. But that will mark the beginning and somewhere between there, and it seems, in my opinion, that, that out of that peace agreement that's strengthened or made, the right for the Jews to rebuild their temple comes out. Because they aren't doing it now, but it's going to be built by the middle of the tribulation. Those two are at least facts. And so... How do you do that? How do you build? Why, why would the Jews even fall for that? How does this work out? Why does this antichrist? And Jesus said, you know, look, you don't receive me as I come in, you know, in my Father's name, but one comes in his own name, him you will receive. This guy who brings peace and brings the temple, they're going to receive as their Messiah. And you may say, how is that possible? How would the Jews who believe... Because we, you know, we think of the Messiah as, as all that Jesus is. So how would the Jews fall for that? Why would they think that, that some man is the Messiah? There's a, couple, there's a couple reasons. The Jews associate rebuilding the temple with the, the ushering in of the kingdom age. They really do. And, and I pointed out, and I don't know, because it would have been a lot of reading to, to cover all the information that would need be, but I pointed to say, hey, why don't you check out the Temple Institute last week? And in their statement of principles, I want to read just a little bit of that. 
This temple institute, this is Jewish. They're looking to rebuild the temple. This is not a Christian thing. It says, why the fuss over an ancient, seemingly outdated concept? What is the relationship does the holy temple have with our world today? The people of Israel have lived without a temple for nearly 2,000 years and seem to be doing fine without one. Why do we seem to need it? And God certainly doesn't. So why think about rebuilding? They list one, because God said so, because they're supposed to be sacrificing and they know it. They know that without um, the Messiah or without blood, there's no remission of sins. And they're practicing, they, they want to practice, you know, they believe the word of God and they can't do it. They're like, we need the temple, because the Torah says so. And so that was one. The next was, uh, well, and that's basically the next they say fish out of water because they can't practice what they believe. And they, they want to come back into a right relationship with God. They believe that temple and sacrifice is absolutely fundamental to that. But here is, here's one that I want, to, I want to take time to read to you guys. And again, this is from the, Jew, from the Jews themselves. Every prophet of Israel, without exception, prophesied that the temple would be rebuilt, ushering in a new era of universal harmony and peace, unparalleled in the history of man. Thus, the movement to rebuild the holy temple is not new. It was born almost 2,000 years ago at the moment the second temple was destroyed. For when the holy temple stood in Jerusalem, it was the soul of Jewish people and the entire world. And as we believe, once again. And they believe that this rebuilding will usher in the kingdom age and the unity of the world around that so important place. So the temple to them is not negotiable. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. And it's fundamental to, to those who, the Orthodox anyways, are looking for. I played this video a few years ago. If you want to pull that up, Carla. Um, because I wanted to hear, you know, just to, to play it from an Orthodox Jew's perspective, but one that many people know, on how would the Jews fall for a Messiah today? Um, so I was curious, by the way, that, you know, the ancient Jews, uh, the, the shoal, and you don't go anywhere after your, your death, right? Yeah, the, the idea of the afterlife is, uh, is a pretty modern invention in Judaism. Yeah. It really, it really yeah. only crops up. Historically speaking, a little bit in the prophets, and it's usually the late prophets. Right. And it's and it's really it maybe as a response to early Christianity or or right. Greek thought. So yeah, in the in the Bible itself, there's no reference in the Torah. There's no right. reference to the afterlife. So what, what, what at do all. you think happens after the death of your body? So I mean, I only have suspicions because again, un unverifiable. My suspicion is that if there What's if there that? is a God, which I believe, Where are you at uh, on that who God? exists outside of time and space. And that what animates me is that I'm made in the image of God, and that what animates my capacity is that I'm made in the image of God, that I reunify with God. That basically, there is a, the, the traditional Jewish take on this has been that there's a cleansing process. Judaism doesn't believe in eternal hell. So it's instead this idea that there's a cleansing process for your, for your soul, the part that you got from God, hey, that's part of you, you got from God, you schmutzed it, schmutzed it up while you're alive, <laughs> and now there's a cleansing process, and then... than it sounded probably a couple of thousand years ago. Yeah, I debunk most of the modern, you know, the singularity's coming, we're going to upload everybody into the cloud, <laughs> and this is not going to happen. No, definitely not. I mean, not. That's, good to, that's good to know, because I just feel like the computer would be really weird. It's, it's weird <laughs> to live inside a computer. But. Or, or, or that we're living in, the, in, in a computer now, but there's no buffering or, you know, little pixels that are going off. Every there. so often when I'm just staring <laughs> off into space, it's because... But, but while I got down. you here, I, I want to push you on something. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my Christian friends and people that I debate, particularly on the resurrection. You know, they have a whole series of arguments. You know, if you just followed our reason, you would accept Jesus as your Savior. And my answer to this is the great Jewish rabbis who are smarter than you and I sitting here, they've gone through all these arguments. Why, why don't they accept Jesus? Why don't you accept Jesus as the Messiah? Okay, so the, the reason that I don't accept Jesus as the Messiah is because I think that a lot of the arguments in faith... So Jesus as the Messiah is a different figure than anything that exists inside Judaism. So when people say that the, the Judaism predicts the, the coming of Christ, uh, the, the change in the nature of what Christ is, what a Messiah would be, is different from Judaism to Christianity. So Judaism never posited that there would be God come to, form in physical form, come to earth in physical form and okay. then you know, acting out in the world in, in that way. 
Judaism posits that God is beyond space and time. Occasionally, he intervenes in history, but he doesn't take physical form. It's one of the key beliefs of Judaism, actually, is an right. incorporeal God. Uh, so that means that it's, it's a, the, the idea is, is actually foreign to Judaism of, of a merged God-man uh, who then is, who is God in physical form, but then dies and is resurrected and all this. this is, it's, a, it's just a different idea than exists in Judaism. So you're not waiting for the Messiah to come. Right. He's not coming in the uh, So in the I, I'm, waiting, I'm waiting for the Messiah to come in the form of a political figure, right? So the, so the, the Messiah in, in Judaism is a guy who's going to come back and is going to establish peace in Israel and is going to assure that, that you know, there's, a, there's sort of a happier world with a bunch of political aspects to it, as, as explained by Maimonides. But he's going to die too, right? He's not going to come back and everybody lives forever and, and any so of that kind of stuff. he's a corporeal agent. He's just like us. Right. But, right. But, and the, 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 in the Jewish view, any person could be the Messiah. Any Jew can be the Messiah in the Jewish view. Right. Right. So I could be it. Who knows? But, it's, <laughs> but I'm not. But well, you're it, off to a good start. But, but, <laughs> but, but that's, that's a different that's view uh, than, than the Christian view. So, the so I wanted to offer lots of context because, you know, they're from a Jewish man, very sharp, does his best to follow Judaism. And he clearly says, and it's clearly understood, they're not, they're looking for a man who can bring peace. A man who's a Jewish man that is going to come and, and is a political figure. And so there's going to be a man who rises out of that chaos that we talked about in the first three and a half years of wars and fights. And he's going to rise up and he's going to broker or strengthen a peace deal in Israel. And it seems most likely that the temple will be a part of that. The catalyst that would seem to open the world up to it, and especially the, the Islamic world, will probably be a great defeat in battle, which would most likely be the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. So again, we have the problem. The, the Dome of the Rock exists. There's another mosque up there. Uh, these are not great visuals. But if you want to pull up one of the slides there, Carla. I must have sent out my laser pointer with Corey. The other one real quick. So as John suggested, I probably should have used Google Earth and it would be much more visual. So you, you probably can't see it, but at the top of the screen, oh, thanks. Uh -huh. Up here, there's a number one. And right there, if you've ever been there, I haven't, so I'm excited. Maybe I'm thinking maybe I should go. There's a little dome called the Dome of the Spirits or the Dome of the Tablets. Many believe now, and it's a growing understanding, that possibly that's actually where the Holy of Holies is. And that the Eastern Gate, where Jesus is going to enter, is actually up in that corner. And thus, um, that's where the temple would go, would be actually on the north side. There's some argument for down around the south, but we'll save that for some other day. So what that means is the temple itself is not actually very big. The temple or the tabernacle is really only about 10 yards wide and about 30 yards long. It doesn't have a big footprint. Now if you look back in verse 1 and 2, and one thing we know about the temple that will be built during this time is that the outer court is given over to blasphemy. It's given over to the court of the, Gen it's over to the Gentiles. So the temple itself is referred to as the temple of God, but it says where normally would be the court of the Gentiles or the outer courts, not the temple proper, there's actually something blasphemous or there's something wrong with that area. So here's a possibility. That through this peace deal that's going to get brokered, that the temple will be rebuilt, but perhaps this would stay. Go ahead and bring up that next slide if you would. So the temple proper would actually fit on this north part up by the well of the spirits or the, the dome of the tabernacles, or sorry, commandments, tablets, up here. And then it would fit on the north part of the, the temple mount. And that where, this, where the scripture talks about being given over to the Gentiles or over to this blasphemy would actually overlay where the current dome of the rock is which does not need to be rebuilt because it's given over to something differently entirely so a real possible scenario is that it's really actually built all of this remains and this will be on the temple mount alongside of it it can it can be done it's not unanimous 
but there is growing scholarship that the temple was actually not in the center, but on the north end, and could actually be rebuilt without destroying the Tome of the Rock. And the court of the Gentiles and this area would be given over to blasphemy and would be given over to um, that which is not God. Trampled on by the Gentiles. Ran by the, over, you know, dominated by the Gentiles until the coming of the Messiah three and a half years later. So, a lot of information, a lot of talk. We just saved that for a conference or something special. But as we talked about last week, I spent a lot of time on the scriptures for the importance of the moment of the middle of the tribulation. This is a little background and history of the possible um, rubber meeting the road of the middle of the tribulation, how a temple could be built, how that could all kick off today. Some estimate as quick as 30 days they can have the temple built. They have everything ready. They're already practicing all the sacrifices. The things are made. They're just waiting for the green light. So it could be done. Is that absolutely going to happen like this? Don't know. But we do those things much like looking at history to allow us to, to learn and to react as we see things unfold, as we see unprecedented peace agreements begin to occur in the Middle East, as we see each year the, the Temple Institute or the, the faithful, they're ready to storm and build this temple. As we look at things unfold, it should be teaching us about our present day. But, all right, so back in Revelation, because we've got to somehow finish the chapter, right? So that was the temple. Daniel said it would be there. Jesus said it would be there. Paul said it would be there. And I believe John here indicates by measurement that it will be there. And that is a possible scenario how it may come to pass. So verse 3 back in Revelation 11. And I will give power to my two witnesses. So in this interlude it also backs us up. Here's some more stuff that's been going on. There's been two witnesses. And they will prophesy 1,260 days in clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before God of the, the, of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut up heaven so that no rain falls. And in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. So these guys, it says that they do this also for 42 months, three and a half years. It seems that when this covenant that Daniel spoke about in 927 gets made or strengthened, I'll just pretend like they were born and, and living. They see this happen. It's unfolding. Well, I guess it's time. So they go over to the closet, grab out their sackcloth, get some ashes, they throw it on. We've got 42 months. A lot of controversy on who these are. I think the best argument, and I won't spend, we don't have time to spend a lot of time on the different thoughts, but I believe that it's Moses and Elijah. They were on the Mount of Transfiguration. The miracles coincide with their ministries. There's a number of reasons why. Um, a lot of, some people think Enoch, but Enoch was not Jewish, and this is specifically Jewish. Um, some people press... Oh, I'm getting off in the arguments. Okay. Two witnesses. I, I believe that they're Moses and Elijah. And the moment that the seven-year cycle begins, their ministry begins. They begin to prophesy, they begin to preach, and they begin to model and call to repentance. And if anybody, and, and it seems that they're, during this first three years of the tribulation, such hatred developed for these men that we're going to see that probably one of the biggest holidays the world has ever celebrated as the world is celebrated for their death. Unifies the world in their celebration of their death. So it seems maybe that their ministry connected to the plagues and the seals and the trumpets that occurred in the first three and a half years. You know, when we saw a third of the world burn, these guys, part of their ministry is to shut up heaven and not allow rain to fall. Perhaps there's some connection there because the world, as we're going to see in a minute, hates them. Not just because they stand for righteousness. There's a reason they hate them. 
But they've been given power, and if anybody tried to do anything about it, their ministry would happen until God appointed that time. And it says that they would be killed in a specific manner, that fire would proceed from their mouth and devour their enemies if they were going to try to do something about it. Like the worst case of dragon breath ever. I'll lighten that up just a little bit. Intense ministry for precisely three and a half years. What would you do? What would your ministry look like if one day you woke up and said, okay, that marks it. I have 42 months. Next month, I have 41 months. All the way down, we've got one month left. And we will die. And we will be with the Lord. What would your ministry in life look like if you had a specific hourglass like that counting down? These guys did, and they were faithful, and they ministered. And there's just something about knowing our God and knowing His calling on our life that just brings a peace and allows us to walk through the circumstances of life. In Acts chapter 12, Peter... <laughs> what a crack up. Well, you can go back and read it in maybe this week or in your time. He, you know, James, the brother of John, has just been killed. Well, the government knows, hey, man, everybody liked that. Let's go ahead and arrest Peter, too. Maybe we'll take him out. And what does Peter do when his friend, somebody he's known personally and intimately for years, a ministry partner, he just dies, and now he's in jail, perhaps the executioner not far away. Well, Peter takes a nap that night. <laughs> and he sleeps so good, an angel's got to strike him to wake him up. <laughs> you take him out. Because Jesus told him, well, you're going to be old and you're going to get crucified. His ministry wasn't done. He could sleep in the midst of all of that. These two witnesses had a specific ministry and nothing could be done about it until their ministry was complete. God has a time and days and ministry appointed to you. And in Him, you are secure. And nothing can be done about that until it's time. You're safe and abiding in Him. Abiding in Him. So, you know, perhaps these two witnesses, perhaps they'll just appear, perhaps they grow up. Next time you're in Israel, maybe you'll be looking around for some guy who looks like Charleston Heston. I don't know. <laughs> what they look like, what they'll do, I don't know, but it tells us a little bit about their dress and their ministry. Verse, <clears throat> verse 7. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, we covered him in chapter 9, verse 11, makes war against them and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom, and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So it seems Satan will come and he will empower the Antichrist, the beast, and at the end of their ministry, God allows it and they are overtaken. And this happens in Jerusalem at first, you know, because Sodom says there's something about where Israel and her prosperity during this time, where it's going to continue and probably grow in immorality, those who don't know the Lord. They're going to grow in the bondage of Egypt. And he makes sure we know what it's talking about, it's because the Lord was crucified there. And then those from the people, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and will not allow their dead bodies to be put in graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. They're going to celebrate their death. The whole world is going to be united. I mean, part, a big chunk of the world celebrates Christmas and a big chunk of... The world celebrates this and that. But the entire world is going to come. They're going to you know, print up their gift cards and greeting cards with one of these verses on there and they're going to send them to each other and rejoice that these two guys are dead. Don't even bury them because that's an insult in there in that part of the world. And for the first time ever, perhaps, we can have a literal fulfillment. You, know, you can watch the wailing wall any point in time. There are places in the world that have a camera on them 24-7 and it seems this, these two will. Leave them in the streets. Celebrate. They tormented us and now we're going to rejoice at their death. 
and perhaps all you know these news channels and the the Fox News and the CNNs and all this will have 24/7 coverage on this. And I thought about that for a moment. It seems maybe that many of the news channels will be fully staffed even after the rapture. You can do do with that what you do with that what you will, but it seems that <laughs> that they can that this is an event that occurs in Jerusalem and the entire globe can see it. One more reason why we live in unique times. The first time that this can be fulfilled. They celebrate it. Dead Prophets Day. Hmm. Now, after three and a half years, the breath of life from God entered them and stood. they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. <laughs> Maybe, just a little. And they heard a voice, a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. I'm ready for that one too. And <clears throat> they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past and the third woe is come quickly. Now there's actually a fault line that runs up through there for about 3,000 miles. And in 2004, NBC, or ABC, no, it was NBC, did a, a news thing on, on how there's still an imminent threat for another earthquake that runs right through Israel. Happen any moment. All set up, ready to go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The Great Rift Valley, it's called. The last time it went off, they say it weakened the earth's crust. It's going to go again. Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ and He shall reign forever and ever. And 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones, fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who was, who is, and was, <laughs> the one who is, and who was, and is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned, and the nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants and the prophets and the saints. And those who fear your name, small and great, and, sh- and should destroy those who destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of the covenant was seen in the temple, and lightnings and noises and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. So as the seventh seal was broken, there was silence for about a half an hour in heaven. As the seventh trumpet blows, there is rejoicing. And as we saw this last increment of time that the angel announced last week, like like winning the the presidential nomination or like winning in November, you begin to celebrate even though you're not actually president for till January. So they begin to celebrate the fact that now is the time, but in three and a half years he will physically reign and they begin to rejoice. And he ends it and closes it before we're going to get into the time where after, after the Antichrist kills the two witnesses, it seems he's going to go right up to the temple and proclaim that he's God and he's going to pursue the Jews to kill them. That In the middle of that, God plants this verse 19. That while he's got the world's attention, they see the Ark of the Covenant in his temple. You know, Indiana Jones was just looking for a copy. Everything that's been on the earth or what we try to find today, that's a copy of the reality in heaven. And God here in the middle of this, before he moves on to this and the events that will occur in the second half, he reminds them of the reality. And what does the Ark of the Covenant remind us? What does it teach us? What was in it? The Ten Commandments? The manna? The rod that budded. Jesus in the New Testament, He's our propitiation. It says it's the mercy seat for us. 
The commandments of God, if we break one, we're guilty of them all, and the punishment is death. Sit under the mercy seat of God, where the blood was applied, that it doesn't have to be applied, that the commandments, they're covered. The substance of life, our need for life, the man of the, the true man of the true bread from heaven, Jesus Christ came down to give us life, to minister to you, that you must be born again, born from above. And how does that happen? We have the illustration of the, the rod that budded this. From a dead stick came life, the resurrection. The Ark of the Covenant also represents the throne of God and where the presence of God is. And God says, you know, because if you don't believe in the true, you will be deceived by the fake. And he opens up as just one more act of mercy, one more reminder before this imposter is going to go in the temple and say that he's God. Opens up heaven and says, here is where the real throne is. Here is where the mercy seat is. Here is where life is. Here's where your provision is. That they might believe. And as we see these things too unfold... God has that for us. I have the worship team. If you guys want to come make your way back up. That we have a constant reminder of things unfolding before us. Each one being a specific call and act of mercy by God. That we can allow the history that has been and the history that's unfolding today to allow us to teach us about our present time. That we might be looking for His glorious appearing. That we are looking for We're looking for a wedding. And each one of these things that come closer to the rebuilding of the temple, each one of these things that come closer, put us closer to being with the Lord. So Father, we ask that uh, though there's a lot of things to talk about this morning, that they would just increasingly make more and more sense. That we'd be increasingly strengthened in the truth of your word and the things that must come to pass. That like Daniel, we would respond in prayer and brokenness for our people, for your people, for our country. That people would see your word is true and it is coming to pass. Lord, bless these guys in Jesus' name. So 
Bless you all. Have a good week. We'll see you next week.